Hey guys, uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Katie Ziskind. I'm the owner of Wisdom Within Counseling and Coaching. I am a Gottman Level 2 Marriage Therapist. I'm emotionally focused, therapy inspired. Um, I also am a certified sex therapy informed professional, which means that I specialize in sexual issues, sexual pain, orgasmic issues, as well as emotional intimacy issues. So if you're feeling disconnected, um, if you're feeling emotionally like you're two ships passing in the night, or you're stuck in a cycle of sexual rejection and just there's no physical touch in your marriage, um, I would love to help you rebuild emotional and sexual intimacy and feel a more meaningful, playful connection with your spouse. You can learn more about working with me at wisdomwithinct.com. That's wisdomwithinct.com. Now you're gonna get to see a behind the scenes of me recording um, my podcast, which is the All Things Love and Intimacy podcast. Um, and I'm the host of it. Um, and we are going to be doing episode 46. So this is going on YouTube. And you're gonna get to kind of see me talk a little bit on my podcast. So you'll get to see the raw kind of unedited version of me uh, recording it. So you may have like some pauses, you may see me cut things out. Um, but today we are going to do a little like raw organic behind the scenes um, footage because I think that's really helpful for you to get to see me as a real human um, and uh, just hear me talk and um, get it, get to see a video. And if you're on Spotify or if you're on Apple Podcasts, you can listen to the podcast for free as well. So um, I just did the intro for the podcast. Um, so you're going to hear me jump right into the episode. Um, so today on the All Things Love and Intimacy podcast, we are talking about building an emotional bond. So first of all, as a human, you are a bonding mammal. This means that you are a type of mammal that typically likes to be in a pair. And yes, sometimes we do have, you know, uh, alternative relationships, structures where people are in, you know, with multiple partners. But for this video, we're going to start with uh, this idea that we are a bonding mammal in a pair. And so we strive to feel comfort through a secure bond with another human, your significant other. And when that person that you want love and connection and reassurance from is ignoring you, is causing you to feel insignificant, is causing you to feel abandoned or rejected, there is both physical and emotional pain that develops. So if the person that you are in a long-term relationship with uh, causes you to feel cast aside, unwanted, um, rejected, uh, that can actually lead to like health issues, anxiety, panic. So what I do is I help you build a secure bond. And sometimes we can have challenges when it comes to building emotional intimacy, which we'll talk about today. Um, so the first thing is uh, understanding that we actually are better as a couple than as individuals. So yes, we all may have our own individual hobbies. We need to have our own sleep routines. We need to make sure we're on a personal level eating nutritious, good foods. But uh, you and your partner, when you bring your best self to your relationship, your most playful self, your silly self, your most passionate romantic self, your most thoughtful self, your most emotionally present self, um, your best communicative self, right? Um, you're actually going to help each other feel stronger. So when you have a secure, strong, loving bond with your partner, you both feel appreciated. You both feel like you matter. You both feel special and valued. And those feelings, when you feel safe, secure, and connected, you actually get to have a stronger immune system. So studies and research show that when you and your partner uh, really do a good job of helping each other feel safe, connected, and close, that your immune system is stronger. So you can both recover from sickness more quickly. You are mentally more present and excited and fulfilled in other areas of your life. So when you have someone that's like, yeah, I believe in you, that boosts your self-esteem. 
And then you can do that for your partner and say, hey, I think you're awesome. Like, you know, go be brave, go out there in the world, be successful. I see you, I'm proud of you. And that boosts your partner's self-esteem and self-worth. So yes, you may be great as individuals, but when you learn really good communication skills and you help each other feel close, and we can talk about skills that can help you both feel appreciated in this podcast, but when you help each other feel close and you have a secure bond, you actually have a stronger physical body as well as an emotional body. So your couple bubble is this invisible boundary around you and your partner. Your couple bubble can be strong when you have really good emotional intimacy skills. And your couple bubble can also get really weak over time. And it can be thin, like any little thing can pop your couple bubble because that sense of uh, emotional intimacy is just not there. And when your couple bubble is strong, you could be on opposite sides of the world traveling and you can feel this strong emotional pull towards each other. And when you have a strong couple bubble, you both feel at peace in your relationship. You make each other's lives easier. You feel reassured and like you can handle anything that comes your way and you see whatever comes your way um, as something that you both can do together as a strong team that instead of this thing coming your way and it being overwhelming or confusing or just this unsurmountable challenge, that instead you see this thing that comes your way, whatever it may be, um, as like a wonderful adventure, as a new journey, as maybe a little bit unknown or unfamiliar, but you can get through it as a team. There is this beautiful we language or us against the world mindset that a strong bond helps you have versus like you against me, right? Or the knock them down um, attitude that we sometimes get into when we get into arguments, um, which is like one upping each other or um, trying to, you know, hurt the other person with negative jabs. So I want us to think about this us against the world team effort, you know, you and your partner on the same team against the world, against the chaos, against the challenges that you will face in your relationship. And part of building emotional intimacy and a secure bond on an emotional level means um, really communicating. So a lot of times we grow up in homes where uh, we don't really see uh, really good communication modeled for us. A lot of times we have role models that are, you know, making sure we have a good roof over our head. You know, we have shelter. And that's a good basic need to have met uh, by parents or caregivers. But we often uh, might even see parents give each other the silent treatment. We might see parents, um, you know, sit on opposite sides of the couch or on separate chairs in silence. We might see parents get louder and louder and yell and yell back and forth in um, you know, a dynamic if we're a child. We may see parents have arguments that escalate pretty quickly. And you might see, if you think back on your childhood, parents that valued either academics or working really hard and a good work ethic, which are awesome qualities. Like those are great value systems, but we also don't often observe um, healthy communication or emotional communication. So a lot of times when we don't have emotional uh, intimacy and emotional communication in a long-term marriage, there is distance that develops. And this can be seen by less physical touch, less sexual touch, and um, we can also see emotions that are really challenging, like feeling hopeless, feeling helpless, feeling tired and exhausted, feeling unwanted, feeling... Um, frustrated, feeling anxious and a sense of panic about your relationship, uh, feeling insecure about your marriage. Um, and you might even fear, you know, that you've been in this state of disconnection so long that you're just always going to kind of be in this state of disconnection. But I'm here to say that there is hope. It's totally possible um, to start to add um, skills to your toolkit. And we call these relational skills. You know, we're not taught about relationships growing up. We are taught about math, science, you know, how to do really well in school, 
and how to get a good job and how to have a career and how to have income, right? So, and those are good skills. Like we're not knocking down those skills. Those are great skills. Um, but we want to learn in this new chapter of your life, um, as you and your partner are co-authoring this new chapter together, um, I want to encourage you to learn skills that will set you up for success in your love life. And when we say love life, we mean emotional love life and sexual love life because they are interconnected. So when you and your partner feel safe together emotionally, there is this beautiful door that opens to feel safe together sexually. So emotional intelligence is a skill just like academic intelligence or money management and financial intelligence or you know intelligence in any area of life, your career intelligence. So I want you to think about as we talk about this conversation, how emotional intelligence is something that is just another field of study, you know? Um, you know, sometimes we have marine biologists and they go in and they study seaweed or they study horseshoe crabs or they study a certain type of fish and that's a field of study. And so then we have like rocket scientists that study like, you know, the payload of these things and, you know, I, I don't know, like in Florida, they have like rockets that go up in the sky and they're kind of cool to watch, but you know, that's a whole field of studying like the curvature of the earth. And like, I don't know, I don't know much about that field. So I personally would have to study a lot to understand like rocket science, but there are engineers that are very focused in that field. So I want you to just think of emotional intelligence as a new field that you can study and learn about to improve your relationship, your romance, and your emotional bond. So one important piece when it comes to emotional intimacy is co-regulation. So this is you and your partner um, vibing off each other, reading each other's body language, tuning into each other to then feel a sense of security and calmness. So co-regulation is about being attuned to your partner's eye movements, noticing if they're crying, noticing if your partner's mouth is smiling or frowning, noticing their tone of voice, um, noticing if their tone of voice is harsh and rigid, or if they're jabbing at you or trying to kick you in the stomach with what they're saying, or noticing if their tone of voice is flirty, silly, lighthearted, playful, um, joyful, if they're enthusiastic with what they're saying. We're reading emotional cues all day. And so part of um, emotional intelligence is knowing yourself and like how you deliver what you want to say with your tone and then also reading your partner. So there's some skills that we can fine tune around our own emotional presence and emotional communication and then also reading our partner's emotional communication. So an example of this is like if your partner, sometimes we our body language and our words don't align and that is a time to check in and co-regulate. So let's say your partner is um, coming in from work after a busy day and they come in and you say, how was your day? And they say, it was fine. They might be verbally saying it was fine, but with your spidey senses, you look at them and you see they're looking at the ground and you see their shoulders slumped and you see them drop their bag on the floor a little more loudly than they normally would. And you're reading their body language to see and you're sensing, oh, maybe they're not fine. Maybe they told me they're fine because they're afraid of being a burden by putting their stress on me, right? And so instead of just taking their I'm fine at face value, you actually look at your partner and you step in to what might be a risky conversation because you could be rejected, but you're going to create a sense of emotional safety by asking your partner about themselves a little bit more deeply. You're going to encourage them to open up to you and you're going to give them an opportunity for you to empathize with their emotions. So their shoulders are slumped. They're looking at the ground. You're sensing that they're not fine, even though they've told you they're fine. And you are going to, from this emotionally intelligent place, say, I see that your shoulders are slumped. I see that you might not be fine. I want to know about your day. Like it, it seems to me like you may have had an emotionally rough day. I want to hear about it. Right? And you're giving your partner an opportunity to then confide in you, which builds security in your emotional bond. And a lot of times 
um, we need a partner to encourage us to open up, to create that safe space. Because growing up, we had to say, I'm fine, right? Even if we weren't fine, we had to say, I'm happy, I'm fine, right? <laughs> so now in your marriage is this time to safely open up, to be receptive, to be attuned. And attunement is a beautiful skill. It increases your own self-awareness and increases the awareness you have of your partner's body language, facial, facial features, and their tone of voice. And um, attunement is also really helpful for reducing conflict and building comfort and safety in your marriage. So co-regulation is when you notice your partner, let's say, having this bad day, and they might share about what's going on, but then you offer them some type of healthy touch. So this could be holding your partner's hand. This could be gently giving them a back massage. This could be giving them a long three or four minute hug. This is a form of healthy touch that allows your nervous systems to both feel grounded, safe, relaxed, um, so for instance, let's just take holding hands, right? Um, holding your partner's hand allows them to feel secure through this physical touch. So the physical touch becomes an avenue or a highway for the emotional experience of bonding. And uh, holding hands or other co-regulation skills um, actually help your partner experience the world in a more emotionally safe way. So what this means is that if your partner had a really rough day at work um, and they come home and their shoulders are slumped, you offering to hold their hand or offering a long hug makes the chaos of their day less intense. So um, there was a, a wonderful study done where um, uh, in a secure relationship, uh, a person was given a, like a, a very, very light shock on their ankle. And it was like a painful shock to like a, a small amount of pain, right? And so they did this study where uh, these people were just receiving the shock and they charted their pain. And then they had their significant other hold their hand, just hold their hand while they still got that shock. And the pain that they received from that same exact shock was much greatly reduced because their partner was holding their hand. So simply holding your partner's hand has a lot more power than you might uh, give it. You know, you have a lot of meaning in your partner's life more than you might give yourself credit for. So holding your partner's hand um, can actually help reduce their emotional pain, the distress they're feeling, and actually um, take away the pain of something like a low-level shock um, through that physical touch. Um, so that's really a beautiful thing. Our brains will experience stress in a less intense way when we have co-regulation, when we have healthy touch, when we have a long hug from our significant other, when we have snuggles and cuddles and are spooning and are being held in a physical way, that safe, trusting relationship is a safe container for actually lowering stress levels and promoting more immune system health and faster recovery from sickness. So co-regulation is a beautiful thing. And it's something that you can both incorporate into your relationship. So if you notice your partner is worried about something, yes, you can ask them about their worries. Um, but also it's really important to offer them a form of physical touch, of healthy touch. Um, and this is also really helpful when you notice there's reactive emotions starting to come up. So if you're getting into a conflict, um, we have uh, what we call our, our primary and secondary emotions. So it's so easy to show anger. It's so easy to withdraw from a situation. So giving the silent treatment or um, yelling or blaming or criticizing our partner or getting defensive is easy, right? That's an easy route to go. It's usually what we see growing up. But if we think about the best relationship skills um, to do in that moment to build emotional connection is really talking about our deeper feelings. So deeper feelings are fears of rejection, fears of insecurity, feeling jealous, feeling shameful, feeling guilty, feeling inadequate is a huge one. Um, feeling helpless, 
um, a lot of times we're not talking about these core emotions. And so um, there is a goal that I often help couples do, which is to talk about what's going on beneath the disconnection, beneath the anger. Um, like think about a tree, right? If you look outside and you see a tree growing, you look at the trunk and you see the branches and the beautiful leaves on that tree. But what you don't see is the massive root system underneath the ground. And so anger might be the trunk of the tree, which we can see with our eyeballs, or disconnection or avoidance might be the trunk of the tree. And then underneath in the ground are the root system. That's the core emotion. So that might be like neglect, fear of neglect, fear of abandonment, fear of being too much, fear of being a burden, right? Fear of being like cast aside or ignored, feelings of insignificance, um, even feelings of abandonment, uh, be, being told we're unlovable or that our love needs are too much or that we're too sensitive, right? And a lot of these roots, these root emotions under withdrawing or anger actually come from childhood unmet love needs and childhood trauma and childhood experiences. You know, so a parent or caregiver that was emotionally neglectful or emotionally abusive, like let's say they a parent or caregiver was an alcoholic or a gambling addict or a workaholic. They didn't meet your love needs, like all of the love needs in childhood, these emotional pieces. So you may have felt alone, left for hours by an alcoholic parent because they prioritized their alcoholism over you. Or maybe you were abandoned by a parent at a young age and felt unwanted by that parent. Or you know, you may have been told, you know, don't be a burden, or we have these very common themes. Don't be too much. Don't be too sensitive. Don't wear your emotions on your sleeve. You know, don't tell anyone what's really going on. Just tell everyone you're happy and you're fine, right? So we have a lot of these deep emotions that come up in our romantic relationships that I want to encourage you to share with your partner. So being emotionally vulnerable is about sharing the roots of your tree, about sharing what's really going on for you when maybe in that moment you do want to close up or closing up is your default um, because of what you had to do to survive your childhood. So core emotions that you might want to share with your partner are feeling sad, feeling hurt, feeling shame, feeling fear, worry, you know, and when you share these with your partner and you have a strong emotional bond, your partner will get curious about what you feel. Your partner might say, you know, oh my goodness, I don't want you to feel sad. Like, thank you for telling me you felt so sad. You know, I had no idea you felt sad. Thank you for sharing that. And your sadness is important to me. What you're feeling is really important to me. I love you. I care about you. Um, and I want to know what I can do to help you feel loved versus make you feel more sad. And um, this can actually really be a beautiful part of co-regulation on the emotional intimacy aspect. Um, and I think too, when it comes to being more finely attuned and uh, really connected on an emotional level and bonded, you can start to de-escalate conflicts. You can start to, you know, say you have the silent treatment for weeks, you might be able to reel it in and build emotional intimacy skills, emotional intelligence skills that, you know, make the silent treatment only last an hour, right? So instead of it being the silent treatment, it's just the coping skill of taking space for an hour or going for a walk or taking a shower. And then you can come back and really share the core emotions um, to really be vulnerable in how you express yourself. Um, because a lot of times what's coming up when you do get into a conflict or a disagreement is a deep core love need that's resurfacing. Like we're, I'm, like, I'm afraid of being too much. You know, as a child, I was always told I was too much or sharing that is actually beautiful and vulnerable and that can increase co-regulation skills and your emotional bond. And you can actually become emotionally sensitive to each other in a beautiful way. So um, I think it's really important uh, for us to just open this dialogue about emotional bonding. So essentially, uh, some core elements when you're looking at increasing emotional intelligence are uh, curiosity and shared optimism. 
So show curiosity about your partner's emotional experience. So often couples, and this is like across the board with couples that I work with, the beautiful couples that love each other so much, tend to get stuck in fact telling or over explaining. So it's really common for us to want to yank all emotion out of an experience and tell facts. Um, and this can look like, uh, you said this. No, I didn't say that. Yes, you did say this. No, I didn't say that. Okay. That is fact telling and that goes nowhere. <laughs> that is the win-win. That's the knock them down. That's the, we're in a boxing ring and we're against each other vibe. And so the point of this is to shift you into us against the world. It's we, it's us, we're a strong team. And uh, when we get into that cycle of disconnection, it's often because we're trying to explain our side um, and we're getting defensive and we're fact telling. So instead of just fact telling, um, because the facts can be helpful, I want you to also layer in your emotions. So share and also invite your partner to use language that's emotionally centered and emotionally focused. And I also want you to share your feelings in a soft, gentle, and playful way. So um, I want you to think about like uh, being really like overly communicative, sharing much more about how you're feeling than you might normally. And also being a much more curious about your partner's experience than you would normally. And also adding a level of sensitivity and gentleness that might seem a little bit unfamiliar or like new or awkward at first, but being extra gentle in your tone of voice is going to go a long way here. So, and this helps both you and your partner identify what you're feeling um, and really understand your emotional experience. And these conversations, they can be risky, right? There's a little risk in being vulnerable um, when you've been hurt or rejected in the past. So you can even start by saying that, you know, I really want to hold your hand. Or I really want to offer you a hug. It seems like you've had a rough day, but I'm scared that you might reject me. Would it be okay if I hugged you? And that's an okay thing to say. It's okay to say, you know, I'm feeling a little reluctant and I need extra reassurance that you want to work on this relationship together, that you want this partnership to be lasting too. I need a little extra um, reassurance that you want me to hug you, that you'll actually receive my hug back, um, that me reaching out and, um, you know, doing this thing for you actually mattered to you. Um, deep down, a lot of times when we go through childhood trauma, neglect, or experience abuse, um, right? even if it wasn't all the time, even if it was just here or there, a little bit of abuse or neglect, we still have scars from that. And a lot of times we learn that we don't matter. We learn that our emotions don't matter, that if we cry, we shouldn't be crying because only babies cry, or um, we shouldn't be crying because working is much more effective than crying, right? Or like we learn these sad, sad narratives. We learn that we don't matter. Um, and that's why it is so much more painful in a marriage, in an adult relationship when we feel ignored or like we don't matter um, or we're insignificant or we start to believe that our partner doesn't want us, um, whether that be emotionally or sexually. And it's painful because it brings up all of those childhood experiences um, that can sometimes resurface in these um, bonds. Because we have a primary caregiver growing up and they kind of set us up for our attachment style in adulthood. And so part of having emotional intelligence, emotional bonding, and emotional security in your marriage is growing a garden together. So you and your partner are gardening you have soil, you have sunlight, there are seed packets, um, you're weeding the garden, you're taking out weeds, which are maybe negative behaviors that no longer serve you. You're planting seeds and you're both nurturing this garden. You are co-creating a relationship. Um, you and your partner are deciding what to plant. 
and we want to plant more security. We want to learn how to plant um, like a shared value system. We want to learn how to plant um, beautiful, gentle conversations. We also need to learn how to plant emotional attunement and to recognize bids for connection and bids for affection. We want to learn how to plant a lot of things in this garden. And a lot of times this garden hasn't been tended to for a number of years. So it's okay for your plants to start out as really small seedlings. But every time that you turn towards your partner, you verbalize appreciation, you verbalize how special and important your partner is to you. Every time you say how much your partner matters to you verbally to your partner, you're growing the seeds and the plants in your garden. Um, and it's also really important. You can never do it too much, right? It's impossible to tell your partner what you love about them too much. If anything, we're not doing it enough, right? We're never taught how to do that. So um, I think a big piece when it comes to building a strong emotional bond in your marriage is verbally, like through words, through love notes, through written letters, um, verbally letting your partner know that you like holding their hand, that even if their hand is sweaty and sticky, that you like holding their hand, that even if, um, you know, <laughs> I was talking with a couple the other day, uh, even if your partner farts around you, that you still like them around you, that even if you're cuddling on the couch and one of you has to fart, um, that you're not going to get like genuinely grossed out. You might be like, oh my goodness, you farted but you're not gonna shame them. You're not gonna be like, oh my goodness, you're disgusting, right? You are going to still love them because they're a human being that you care about so deeply in this world. And so it's always good to verbalize more than you might think is necessary that you enjoy your partner's company, that you enjoy quality time with your partner. Everything, hey, I enjoyed the shower we took this morning together. I know it was kind of rushed. I know it wasn't as long as you would have liked, but I am so, so grateful that we had a chance to shower together. I think you're an incredibly beautiful or handsome or sexy or attractive human. And say these things out loud because so often um, these are important ingredients in creating a secure marital bond. Um, so you and your partner are creating this garden. And when you, your partner does something you really like, can let them know, hey, I really liked that you made dinner last night. The pasta was cooked so perfectly. It was delicious. It meant so much to me that after my day, I could sit down to a warm meal and I feel so grateful we sat down to dinner together. I know sometimes we have to have dinner at different times or in different rooms or whatever, you know, but I am so grateful we sat down to dinner at the same time. It makes my day when we sit down together and eat dinner. And it makes me feel so good and so happy inside when I get to taste what you cook. And verbalizing it to that degree, right right now for you might seem like kind of new or unfamiliar, or a little over the top, but I'm telling you that is actually a perfect amount. <laughs> um, so let your partner know why they are special to you and what you would miss about them if they were not in your life. Um, we often grow up not learning how to let our partner know uh, why they matter and we grow up without people teaching us how to do this. So I want to encourage you to express gratitude um, and really share your emotional experience about whatever you're saying you're thankful for or you appreciate about your partner. And you can also shift into expressing um, fondness, admiration. Um, you can also let your partner know like what they do that you like and then what's meaningful about that. You know, say your partner like helps you with getting your car for an oil change you know, hey, it really meant the world to me that you took time out of your day um, to do this thing for me regarding my car. Like it helps me feel safe knowing that my car is taken care of. Um, you know, and this is a really big piece in preventing relational injuries as well. So every time that you experience 
or express give and receive appreciation fondness admiration like verbal praise to your partner or your partner gives it to you which is a form of emotional intelligence and does take conscious effort um, to do um every time you do that you are putting money into your emotional piggy bank so you and your partner you're growing this garden but every time that you give appreciation um, or gratitude and receive it, you're essentially putting a penny into a piggy bank. And eventually over time, you'll have a thousand dollars. But when uh, one of you creates a betrayal, which is an attachment injury or relational injury, then it's essentially like taking like a thousand dollars out of that piggy bank in one moment. So essentially we need these small uh, bids for affection and the gratitude and appreciation to add up over time slowly, uh, which essentially prevent major attachment injuries. It builds your couple bubble. It makes your couple bubble really strong. Um, and then uh, essentially when we do have an attachment injury or relational trauma or betrayal, it's often because we didn't verbalize appreciation enough or we didn't add those pennies to the emotional piggy bank in advance so we can look back and say wow we were missing a lot of ingredients from that recipe of a healthy marriage um if you do have a betrayal of some kind um, which can often be infidelity emotional cheating or physical cheating um, and betrayals can also be um like being ignored or um being denied or uh, affection or being abandoned feeling abandoned within your relationship on an emotional level can also be an attachment trauma um, so I think that it's really beautiful to explore emotional bonding from a perspective of optimism. Shared optimism is important when it comes to thinking about your marriage. So this is the us against the world mindset. This is, we can handle anything that comes our way. We're going to be okay. No matter what comes our way, we got this. You and me, we're on the same team. That mindset is essential and it is a mindset that successful, healthy couples have. Um, you know, you're essentially turning to your partner, telling them about your day first and foremost before you tell anyone else. If you have a problem or a stressor or challenge, you go to your partner and you say, hey, I'm dealing with this. What's your perspective on it? You and your partner have this beautiful best friendship connection where you're confiding in each other on an emotional level when you have worries, stressors, or problems. And this creates an essential foundation um, for dealing with any sexual challenges. So you bring this same mindset of optimism, playfulness, connection, and emotional attunement to your sex life. So um, a lot of times when we look at uh, sexual connection, it means different things to each person. So for one person, sex might mean a sense of connection. For another person, sex might mean um, they get a sense of self-esteem or they get a sense of self-worth from it. Another person might think that sex is a metaphor for being in sync and feeling a sense of togetherness. Another person might um, experience sex and really enjoy the sense of pleasure and fun and mental liberation from the sexual experience. And another person might want sex because they want to have a baby and are, they're wanting to you know, really optimize having a child and sex has more of a um, outcome oriented perspective when we're trying to have a child, which can take the fun and playfulness out of sex. Um, but a lot of times we have different needs when it comes to sex and different meanings. So by building a strong emotional bond and maintaining emotional intimacy and building your emotional skill toolbox, you can create a really beautiful foundation um, when it comes to the sexual desire aspect of your marriage and uh, developing a sense of eroticism through this safe emotional foundation. Because if you can talk to each other and feel safe around each other emotionally, that paves a beautiful foundation in allowing your sexual erotic self to come out and play. Because uh, that's really vulnerable too. Um, so essentially when we're looking at incorporating more positive sexual erotic experiences into a long-term love life, we are not focusing on penis and vagina sex. Our society focuses way too much on that being the end goal. 
And if you haven't had sex for a while or you've been struggling emotionally with intimacy, you know, that's probably the last thing on your, on your mind. It seems very, very far away to go from feeling disconnected to then penis and vagina sex. So I want you to start small. Um, sex can be anything from cuddling on the couch, right? That's a sexual erotic self coming out. Uh, being naked together, sleeping naked together is your sexual erotic self coming out. I don't want you to think of sex as penis and vagina sex as the action. I want you to think of sexual intimacy as connecting to your playful pleasure self and this playful self within you that's always there, this sense of um, desire, right? And sometimes uh, we get disconnected to this side, this erotic side of ourselves. And it can be really hard to bring back that flirty side in a marriage when we're disconnected from that self within us, within ourselves. So uh, as part of building a healthy sexual relationship in your marriage is connecting to your sexual self with confidence and with playfulness and um, knowing it's okay to be an erotic being. Like your sexual urges are normal, your sexual fantasies, your sexual boundaries, your sexual needs and desires are absolutely okay and you deserve to have a sexual voice. And um, building a foundation of emotional intimacy supports um, exploring new sexual techniques or exploring new um, positions or exploring new sex toys and having safe emotional sexual encounters. So emotional intimacy is going to be a beautiful, beautiful uh, part of this garden in your marriage. And remember that there is this positive feedback loop between healthy emotional expression emotional vulnerability, helping your partner feel seen, loved, appreciated, comforted, and reassured emotionally, which means communicating your emotions, asking your partner about their day, asking your partner about their feelings, having emotional-centered conversations um, versus those fact-telling conversations or overly explaining conversations. And uh, there's, there's this beautiful positive feedback loop between emotional intimacy and sexual openness and sexual intimacy. So um, we also initiate sex differently. So sometimes um, we're initiating, one person might be thinking they're initiating sex by wanting to hold their partner's hand. But to the partner, that's just a form of connection. Or another person might be initiating by kissing or you know, touching the other person's butt. And we have to kind of talk about, okay, how do you initiate? How do I initiate? Um, how do I reach out for physical touch? How do I let you know I'm in the mood? You know, how do we approach each other in a sexual way? And what feels good for me? What feels good for you? And uh, sex, ideally, and all types of physical and sexual touch in your marriage do need to be enjoyable. They need to be enjoyable for you. They need to be pleasurable for you. And this does come down to some biology because the female body and the female pleasure system, sexual pleasure system, requires about 45 to 90 minutes of foreplay. This means 45 to 90 minutes in order for the vulva and vagina area to become circulated with blood. In the same way, a man's penis or a penis owner becomes hard, erect, and the penis be gets circulation right through sexual arousal and becomes hard the same thing happens to the female or vulva owners clitoral area and vagina and so there's just a different length of time that happens between uh, vulva owners and penis owners so uh, for a female or vulva owner we need 45 to 90 minutes of foreplay and the male body or a penis owner only needs four to eight minutes um, to go from no arousal to peak sexual arousal. And peak sexual arousal is what supports orgasming. So in order for a female partner to experience pleasure, satisfaction, and enjoyment sexually, um, she'll often need 45 to 90 minutes of massaging, gentle caressing, both emotional and sexual stimulation before any sort of penetrative sex is even on the table if it is on the table. Um, and so 
uh, there's this beautiful education, sex positive education regarding the time it takes for adequate foreplay to support female sexual satisfaction and female arousal and then orgasming, which is a byproduct of pleasure and enjoyment. So um, when we talk about sexual intimacy, having safe conversations about sex and talking about, hey, this is what I find pleasurable or you know, this is what I need when it comes to sexual connection, or, you know, this is what I need um, in terms of enjoying the experience more on a sensory level or a mental level. All of that comes from having emotionally attuned conversations. Um, So I want to kind of wrap up this episode by saying that emotional intimacy is something that you can learn at any age, no matter your religion, your nationality, your gender, no matter what type of relationship structure, no matter what type of sexual relationship you're in or however many years you've been together. It doesn't matter. Emotional intimacy is possible. Emotional expression skills, vulnerability, um, giving each other comfort, recognizing and understanding what bids for affection, attention, and security are, all of that's totally possible. There is hope for you. If you feel disconnected right now, you're not alone. There are a lot of other couples in your same shoes, um, learning these same things, growing, and you are a resilient human, right? You've grown in other areas of your life. You know, there's potential and possibility for growth here as well. And learning these relational skills, especially in terms of emotional intimacy, actually improve your bond. As we talked about earlier, having a secure bond boosts your health, boosts your immune system. Um, It can help to lower stress, lower anxiety, lower the impact of physical pain. Um, And so there's a lot of uh, benefits when it comes to developing reassurance, emotional safety, security, playfulness, um, and learning how to communicate your emotions, which are often new skills because we don't learn these things growing up. So if you're looking to improve the emotional bonding in your relationship, or if you're looking to improve the sexual passion and erotic connection in your marriage, I would love to support you. I'm Katie Ziskind. I own Wisdom Within Counseling and Coaching. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in multiple states. I'm a relationship coach. I'm a certified sex therapy informed professional. I'm a Gottman level two marriage therapist. And I specialize with distant couples who love each other, who want to grow together, who want a meaningful, secure, confident bond, both emotionally and sexually. So a lot of times we're missing out on emotional connection. We feel unseen. We feel unwanted. We feel cast aside. And that is a really good reason to start with me. As well, you may feel sexually rejected, like your partner is avoiding you, or like you don't know really how to rebuild your sex life. And you've gone for a number of months or or even a number of years without having a physical touch in your relationship and would like help rebuilding sexual confidence and um, really have a safe space in your marriage for a physical touch. So I love to help you build emotional and sexual intimacy. You can learn about working with me at wisdomwithinct.com. That's wisdomwithinct.com. And if you are enjoying this podcast and episodes, I would love it if you left a five-star review. You can scroll down on whichever platform you are listening on and click the five star button and it will prompt you to uh, write in there some things that you enjoyed about this podcast. So I would love it if you wrote two takeaways or two positive things that you want to bring into your relationship from this podcast today regarding emotional expression and emotional intimacy. Maybe two things you learned, maybe two things that you would like to highlight for other listeners of this podcast. Um, And this helps you also kind of reflect on what you enjoyed and two tips that you want to start to integrate into your relationship toolbox, into your relationship garden um, to maintain a beautiful, meaningful, comforting, safe, passionate, and playful love life. Um, So you can leave that five-star review on any platform you're listening on. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of the All Things Love and Intimacy podcast.